Oh my god! 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 Oh my god!
But at the height of his career, he was murdered. Now, some accounts say 33, some say 44, and some don't list the number at all. But we do know that the way he was set up by the other side was to be Earth's forerunner to a real Mashiach-like figure. This is one of the reasons why we championed him so much, because we figured that he would be the one to help us be delivered. But of course, the enemy typically works like that. It comes in the form of something that you want. And the devil was being preemptive here by placing his counterfeit Mashiach like figure ahead years, thousands of years before the true authentic Mashiach figure would appear here on earth in the flesh. But when he was murdered, the worship went underground and became occultic. Not just that though, but now it was a cold regime where before it was just him, but now on Ishtar and now on whomever you choose to call her with the newborn son Temuz or Horus which we spoke of in the first part are now reigning jointly and the torch or the light being that they are the light bearers so to speak went from Nimrod and passed into the hands of her and this is why she holds the torch this is why all Olympic games which is a ceremony dedicated to the gods of Olympus or Mount Hermon. We spoke of Zeus and his acuriastic love with Gaimedes. But the Olympics is done to commemorate these gods. And one must pass the torch. The eternal flame that lights all of darkness. This is what they tell their constituents. And this is what you take part in if you have ever done any Olympic style games arena competitions doesn't matter how good you are you cannot remove the origin and why it's here on her head she wears the crown symbolizing her right to rule her divine right to rule and before the year 2001 she stood before two pillars the twins 11 l even which we spoke on in an earlier part of this series They've since destroyed those two pillars and have made it one as that was Nimrod's whole mission to begin with. To get us in the mood to be one nation under a groove. One nation under a groove. Getting down just for the bunker. Now here's some interesting facts on the Trebi Fountain located in Rome, Italy. Now when you look into the iconography, and this is just a quick Google search here on the Trevi Fountain, you'll see down here it says Triton's Guide Oceanus Shell's Chariot Taming Hippocamps. So Oceanus is one of these demigods we've spoken of before, and he's guiding Triton, who is the Greek god of the sea, son of Poseidon, whom we spoke on again in the last part. But what I want to touch on here is the hippocamps and when you go over to the hippocamps and you look at what they're depicted as this is a seahorse which automatically brings me back to the days of noah and what they were doing with possible gene splicing because we see several depictions of half breed animals have humanoids and the like we've talked about myrmids and mermen but if you had kings of the sea and they had chariots well what would be pulling those chariots horses of the sea and this is where the hippocamp is. And when they're plural, they're known as hippocampi. Now my question is, where have we seen this figure before? Well, for all those who are really into the zodiac, you have seen it known as the Capricornus. Or the House of Capricorn. Half horse, sometimes gold, and half sea-like creature. And I want to read what they tell you this Capricornus represents in related mythical animals says here closely related to the hippocampus is the sea goat represented by capricorn a mythical creature with the front half of a goat and the rear half of a fish canonical figures most of which were not themselves goat images and coins of the korean goddess associated with aphrodite as the aphrodite of aphrodiasis through the interpretatio gracia shows the goddess riding on a sea goat here it says Bodhi describes her thus. A semi-nude female figure appears riding on a sea goat. We've seen this before. Accompanied by a dolphin and a triton. 
This is the goddess Aphrodite herself, shown here not in her distinctive local guise, but in the more traditional Hellenistic style, that's Greek style by the way. She's the marine aspect of Aphrodite, known to the Greeks as Aphrodite Pelagia. She rides on a fantastic marine creature with the body and tail of a fish and the forepart of a goat. The sea goat moves to the right and turns his back to look at the goddess. This group also appears on Aphrodisian coins from the 3rd century AD. The Trevi Fountain, a Roman icon. In so many movies, it's practically a movie star. Three coins in the fountain. With its own box office gold. The reason? Every day, tourists from around the world crowd around to toss a coin. Katie and Megan are from St. Louis. I hear you're supposed to find love if you throw it over your right shoulder. That's only part of it. Throw the first coin and you'll return to Rome. A second coin and you'll find love. The third, marriage. All those wishes and loose change add up. Today, officials announced that just last year they took in $1.5 million. Loose change to you and me, one big donation to the Catholic charity Caritas. Now, these people who throw these coins into the river, they throw the coins with their right looking over their left in the same fashion that the sea goat moves to the right and turns his head back to look at the goddess. Some of the earliest prosperity deities were that of the marine kingdom. Now the ancient Canaanites were seafaring people. Some scholars relate or correlate them to the Phoenicians. You know some accounts do vary. If they're not the same, they were super closely related also being a Semitic group of people, these were the inhabitants of Canaan before the children of Israel moved in. Now the Canaanites were indeed a seafaring people living in the Levant, which is that strip you see here. And of course, as you see, they had the sea into their backs. It is known by many scholars too that their navigational skills on the marine course and the ocean itself was so advanced that most scholars tend to downplay it because they may have in fact made the first transatlantic voyages back before Columbus did in 1492 and going to places like South America, Florida and the like. They are also credited with creating the oldest verified alphabet which they helped to translate throughout their tree going through the Mediterranean world. And most languages now can have characters that are trees back to this earlier crude form of communication. Now through trade and seafaring voyages that the Canaanites or the Phoenicians were known to do, their alphabet also got spread to other coasts, cultures, peoples, and regions. And it would always take on a different approach and it got to the point that now we have a lot of their characters in our alphabet. But the Canaanites and the Phoenicians did not obtain this mighty empire by themselves. Looking at where they're located, again, the sea is at their back, and that's exactly who they called upon, the spirits of the marine kingdom. Once they entered into a contract with these marine kingdom spirits, they were gifted with safe voyage travels throughout the seas, as well as expansioning their empire. And all they had to do was but offer a sacrifice. So at the port, we get our word portfolio from this. That is where they would chant to the mer spirits, again the merchants, who were made rich by these spirits. And their chants would invoke the mer spirits or the marine or water spirits before they gave up the sacrifice at the port. Added on a list of many gifts gifted to the people by these spirits were technological advancement. This would explain how they may have had the ships to traverse open water well before Columbus and the Europeans did it. With this information, knowing that Israel had close proximity with these people who were still around, we were told to get rid of them, but we did not do so. And there were a good deal of Phoenicians or Canaanites who ultimately assimilated into Israel. The first sin of the Canaanite people was that of sexual perversion and pride. In Job chapter 4 verse 34, it says, when speaking on the Leviathan, it looks down on all that are haughty. It is king 
over all that are proud. Leviathan is the king of pride. And if you go up a little further, you read about his scales that are so tightly interwoven together that these are his pride because no one can damage this great serpent who is able to apparently spit out fire through his nostrils and mouth and such a gigantic size that it makes even the most fiercest of warriors tremble. And his realm is in the marine kingdom, the water. And he is called the king of pride. And make no mistake about it, there are those who think that this description of the Leviathan and Job is something that's metaphorical and only spiritual. And I tell you, if you read the text for what it says and what it is, there was a real fear that the father had to remind Job of. And it was more than just spiritual. There's a real physical threat down in the deep. Now, is there a spirit of Leviathan? Absolutely. Because we know that pride is a spirit. And so, so often you hear people when they're wrestling with the spirit of pride, they may in fact be wrestling with the spirit of Leviathan, who is a strong one and a marine kingdom dwelling spirit as well. And back on the Canaanites, on land, they were accused of sexual immorality going all the way back to the curse of Ham in Genesis, dealing with Noah and his sons. Then they find themselves at the coast, at the edge of the land, looking out into the marine kingdom, and then they take up refuge and they go into open contracts, maritime spiritual contracts with these unclean spirits from days of old, bringing on their pride. And this seems to probably happen at a later time because when we started to look at the land via Abraham, Yahweh had told Abraham their sins had not culminated just yet. He allowed them to continue to move and grow, but not in him. They grew in sin. And so if you think, listener, that the Most High will never give up on you because you haven't been chastised or punished or cut off thus far or routed from your land or your home or your family or your situation, take note of the Canaanites. He gave them enough rope to hang themselves. And when the land was then made empty from our conquest of vanquishing some of these Canaanites out, he then turned around and gave us the same promise. So long as we stayed obedient, we could keep what we had reaped. And of course, you know, we didn't. But because the Canaanites had the first seafaring empire and were able to go and do things that Nimrod could not, we can clearly surmise that they were the first bankers. While standing on the river banks, dealing and conducting trade. Two of the top favorite deities to invoke was Ishtar and of course Dagon who we spoke of in part one of this series. And when they would go on these seafaring trades to gather up metals and other precious things, they would call on Dagon and pray that they would get favorable currents on the sea. Currency. The exchange of money for goods is called a sail. The ships would set sail for this trade. This is why the day we talk about cash flow, liquid assets, frozen assets, and anything related to water. And under further inspection, it would seem that the United States of America has also made the same covenant with the Marine Kingdom. When you examine the massive painting on the Capitol building in Washington, DC, let me explain to you what you see. The apotheosis of George Washington depicts the founding fathers naked in alliance with Venus. In some cultures, she's also referred to as the sea goddess. And Neptune, the pitchfork welding Poseidon. Who else do we know is known to hold a pitchfork? Now, because it is unholy union that America has with the sea spirits, the law of the land is now governed by the law of the sea. And for those who are cognizant, if you've even studied a quarter of an inch into the UCC and its concepts, you know exactly what I'm speaking on. The straw man, the corporation versus the natural man. Maritime law, which seems to govern the courts of the land. And most citizens are not aware that the rights you think you have, you really don't. See, y'all gave you rights on the land, y'all given rights. But the people who rule the land do not go by land-given laws. They go by sea, maritime law. 
And so often not, what you'll find is that when in court, even when you have a case, you have no jurisdiction. You are lost at sea from the time that you come from your mother's womb. And out of your mother's womb, when she breaks water, you then have to go to dock. As all ships have to dock, you go to see the doctor. Have you ever considered that all ships are female? When a ship is starting to sink, she's taking on water. When she collides with another ship, it, they're always referred to as a female. When that woman is pregnant, she is a vessel. And again, when her water breaks, they claim jurisdiction over her birth canal. And she delivers to Doc or the doctor. And this is why the delivery is documented with a birth certificate. Because in trade, that's known as a manifest. Someone signs for the handing over and or receiving of the product, which happens to be you. And for this reason and this reason alone, I do not contract with the government because the government contracts with these unclean spirits. And you can never win when you step into their jurisdiction because you have none. You cannot argue y'all given rights because they don't acknowledge nor follow those. And from birth, you had already been signed up to be sold out. So before you can argue anything, you have to first strip away what your parents and their parents and their parents and so forth put on you. And that's no easy task. The occult language that they tie up into law language and legalese and Latin and the spell of spelling makes it almost impossible for the average citizen to unwrap themselves from this web of entanglement that this system has been created to trap you in. But be of good cheer, there's but one individual who is coming and is near. And when he returns, only those who contract with the beast shall be in fear. With pride on the rise, what you're going to see in these last days is nation warring against nation and we've already discovered who the king of pride is. They are going to travel from air, land, and of course sea to conduct this war, which is very scripted. You see countries coming together making new alliances like the BRICS coalition. And that's by no coincidence neither. Tensions are rising in one of the most hotly contested regions on the planet, the South China Sea. China's President Xi Jinping compared the BRICS economic bloc to a giant ship sailing forward against raging torrents and storms. Make no mistake, the man's rebellion took place on the land. There is something in the water. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is not available. At the tone, please record your message. This is a representative of the Most High calling to ask about your soul. Are you going to pick up? <laughs> 